20 of the best pieces of travel advice I've ever received. I'm Chris. This is Yellow Productions. I do travel guides that are fun, informative, and entertaining. And in my life of traveling, I have learned that travel is more than just an event, but travel is a lifestyle. And in this video, I'm going to give you some tips and lessons learned that I've had throughout the years to help improve on that lifestyle. Maybe to make things more comfortable, maybe to make things cheaper, better. Overall, hopefully you can take away some of these tips and advice that I've received. We'll be talking about advice I've gotten from people like my mom, my dad, my wife, and friends, family, co-workers. So it's all good here. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the first best piece of travel advice I've received. And this one is from my mom. And my mom always said, Chris, make sure to get a good hotel in the center of the city. And this was something that I didn't always do at the beginning traveling. I would get hotels that maybe were cheaper and a little bit farther away, but I've quickly learned not to do that because if you get hotels that are far away from all the things you want to see, you spend a ton of time every day just going back and forth from where your hotel is to the center of the city. And having a hotel in the center of the city is really convenient because in the middle of the day, if you need to rest, if you need to take a nap, if you need to buy stuff and drop it off at the hotel, you can if it's in the city center. Really hard to do if it's outside of the city center. The other part of this tip, though, is not just get a hotel in the city center but it's get a good hotel in the city center. There's nothing really to ruin your trip more than a lousy hotel that you can't sleep in, and so it's worth spending a few extra dollars to get a hotel that you can actually sleep in well and has a good location. Uh, and, you know, this the, the, the corollary on this one, I've got a few corollaries on some of these tips, is uh, related to hotels that maybe are not good. Motel 6? Yeah, definitely, definitely a yuck on Motel 6. This is not to say that I haven't ever stayed at Motel 6. I have once. I think that one time at Motel 6 was definitely enough for me. Uh, now, when I say a good room, what makes a good hotel room? Well, for me, mention when I can sleep in. I'm a light sleeper, and so I always ask for a quiet room at check-in. So when I check in the hotel, I say like, hey, checking in. I show my ID, and then I say, hey, I'm a light sleeper. I'd really appreciate a quiet room. If it's really important for me that the room is quiet, like I look at the hotel, one side of it's on a freeway, the other one isn't, I'll actually call ahead a few days before and ask if they can put a note on my reservation to request a quiet room. And the other corollary to this tip, also from my mom, it's okay to ask for another room. It's not just okay. If you don't like your room, ask for another room. I've been in some hotels where I've gone through three, maybe even four rooms before I found one that was actually good, satisfactory, wasn't across from the elevator, wasn't across from the ice machine, didn't have other people's stuff in it. Uh, yeah, for sure. Carlos asks, what if there's no good hotel in the city? Then I won't be going to that city. Uh, I only like to go places that have good places to stay. The second best piece of travel advice I've ever received is to not be cheap on attractions in a destination. This tip is from Rick Steves. Yes, Rick Steves, the famous travel guide writer that writes those blue travel guides all about Europe. Rick Steves says when you've taken a trip someplace, you've already spent thousands of dollars on flights, on hotels, you've taken time off work. Why would you be cheap about the $20 admission to the museum? Maybe the museum seems like it should only cost $10 to you, and $20 is expensive, but you know, that extra $10 in the scheme of the five or $10,000 you've already spent to get to this place is not worthwhile saving. So some of those things on travel attractions are going to be expensive, but they're worth the price to pay for them. And another one that... Uh, I've really had to think about with this is sometimes I'll be out and about in a destination and I'll be thirsty. And, you know, the water is expensive. Do I really want to spend $5 on a bottle of water? And when I first started traveling, I'd be like, no, I'm not going to do it. I'm going to wait till I get to a grocery store or someplace cheap that I can buy because it's not worth $5 for a bottle of water. But let me tell you, it is also not worth spending two hours of your trip dehydrated and parched when you could have just spent $5 on that bottle of water. Speaking of which, what am I drinking today? 
Today I'm drinking a Thai iced tea, but not just any Thai iced tea. It's Thai tea that comes in a bottle. One of our favorite Thai restaurants is this place called Ayara Thai. It's right next to Los Angeles International Airport. If you're flying in and out of LAX and you want some really good Thai food, check out Ayara. And you can get their Thai tea in a bottle, which that is pretty tasty. Now, Scottman895 Travel says Rick Steves is very helpful with trip planning. He sure is. Martin says Rick Steves is the legend. He is a legend. And Kathy agrees on this one and says, good advice, don't be stingy. Don't be stingy at all. I agree. Uh, and Martin says uh, when he stayed at the Travel Lodge, the 10th room was okay. I'm glad you found at least one that was okay at the Travel Lodge. The third best piece of travel advice I've ever received is to plan out what you're going to eat. This is a bit of advice from my wife, OC Girl. Uh, and before this, when I'd go on travel, I would just eat whatever was nearby. So, um, for example, if we're in Spain and we're seeing the um, what Sagrada Familia, the big church, I'd be the kind of person after that just be like, I'm hungry. There's Burger King across the street. Let's just eat at the Burger King. It's here. We're here. It's cheap. It's fast. Let's go. And I didn't realize I was really missing out on a lot of good food. And OC Girl, she's all about – she almost researches the food as much as the destinations. Actually, she researches the food more than the destinations. And we have this whole map of um, potential options we could eat. Like if we're going to eat 10 meals in a destination – you know, breakfast, lunch, dinner, uh, we've probably got 20 options laid out depending upon where we go. Um, and it's also really important to really research the food because there's so many different options and not just on TripAdvisor because on TripAdvisor, you're going to find the food that's popular with tourists and you really want to find the food that's popular with locals instead of the food with tourists. Uh, when we travel, we use Google Maps to pin all the eating destinations that we want to go to. And so then whenever we are in the city, we can just pull it up, see all the pins, and then figure out one close by uh, that we want to eat at. Now, a corollary to this one is that in Asian countries, um, say Japan or Taiwan, if you're offered a choice of breakfast, the Asian breakfast or the Western breakfast, I've learned that the Asian breakfast is usually better than the Western breakfast. In Japan, the Japanese breakfast is typically better than the Western breakfast. They've got pancakes, and they've got scrambled eggs, and they've got bacon. They resemble them in look. They just don't very much taste like them. And, you know, you might not be someone that necessarily might like fish for breakfast, because that might be the Japanese breakfast. But I'll tell you, if you can appreciate it, uh, it's likely better. And if not, I would just say just go for the cultural experience because you can get bacon, eggs, and pancakes so much better back home. Um, and let's hit the road, Jack, says Rick Steves has great maps that show where the recommended restaurants and hotels are in relation to each other. That's really great in relation to uh, attractions. I agree. Jordan says... Chris, never go to a restaurant near a popular tourist attraction. That's a pretty good uh, rule of thumb, I would say. Esther gives a good one, which is make reservations ahead of time. I agree. If it's a really popular place, definitely make them ahead of time. The restaurant that I've had the best sushi ever, we probably had in Tokyo, we had to make reservations like three months before we went there, but it was totally worth it. Carlos says In N Out Burger equals love. You can never go wrong with In N Out Burger. That is true. Um, and uh, Leandra also agrees on the previous note about don't be stingy on attractions, but be willing to research. Some spots will offer discounts on certain days and certain seasons. That's a good tip, too. There are better, but, you know, if you've got a Groupon or something like that, definitely check that out. Or certain times. For example, most people maybe don't realize if you're going to Disneyland in Tokyo, they offer, like, all-day tickets, but they also offer an evening ticket, which is near, like, half the price if you just want to go in after 6 o'clock. So you don't got a lot of time. You can get cheaper things sometimes going later to attractions. The fourth best piece of travel advice I've ever been given is related to rewards programs. And it is to focus on just a few rewards programs. I read a lot of frequent flyer type blogs. Uh, this one in particular comes from the One Mile at a Time blog. Uh, and here, really, the idea is that 
there's so many different rewards programs from all the different airlines. And if you travel on a lot of different airlines, you will never get enough rewards in anything to really redeem for any rewards that are useful. Instead, it's better to focus your rewards on a program in each of the major airline alliances. Uh, there's One World that has American Airlines as the major American carrier in it. There's Star Alliance that has United Airlines as the major American carrier in it. And there is Sky Team, which has Delta as the major American carrier in it. And depending upon, it doesn't matter what airline you fly in those different alliances, you can credit your miles back to one airline. So United is generally my main airline, but if I fly ANA or Singapore, I will put in my United number and get United miles, so I've got more miles to redeem, and also more elite credits if we do that. Uh, and throughout this, in addition, you know, like this isn't just maybe airlines, but it's also hotels. If you stay at a lot of hotels and you like Hilton's, Merritt's, or Hyatt's, try to focus on one of them so that you can get elite status in those uh, chains. This has been really useful for me um, to be able to get lifetime status. Many airlines and hotels offer lifetime status when you reach certain tiers. So I've been able to reach million miler status with United and then lifetime titanium elite with Marriott, which is like over a thousand nights at Marriott's. But then at this point, I don't have to run the treadmill anymore more on some of those programs and uh, can focus on some of the other ones. Points Traveler gives a tip, which is don't don't get a spray tan going to Hawaii. No, actually, get your spray tan in before going to Hawaii so that when you go to Hawaii, you already look tanned. All right, good tip, points travelers. Uh, Wu Taiwan says Unite is good. Qantas is the best, I think. Qantas is pretty good if you're going to or from Australia for sure. And Kathy says, uh, we concentrate on Qantas, which is in one world. I would definitely pick Qantas over American Airlines as well. Wu Taiwan says, thank God you are live. My wife is watching 90 Day Fiance, and this is 100x better. I'm glad you think this is 100x. I agree. Um, might even be 1,000x better than 90 Day Fiance. Um, and... Uh, er and Wild Foodie Tours, who is also foodie, says, I plan a trip, then look for great food spots along the way. I think that's a good tip as well. Uh, Eric wants to know, what are my recommendations for camera gear to record those special moments? In the description of nearly every video that I do, I put all the equipment that I use. Um, I happen to like camcorders because they have stabilized lenses. So my main shooter is a Sony 4K camcorder with a really stabilized lens. When we're just going uh, out and about on our daily lives, we carry a Sony ZV-1. It's a small pocket camera uh, that has a one-inch sensor, so that's a pretty good one as well. It's not great for vlogging because it doesn't have a, a wide uh, field of view, but if you've got someone to hold the camera for you or you're shooting distant ones, I like the Sony ZV-1 for a small compact form factor. Uh, and then your cell phone is certainly better than nothing. I've actually been shooting a lot of my, not a lot, all my walking tours lately on my Samsung Galaxy S21 Ultra that I've paired with a DJI Osmo Mobile 4 gimbal in order to make the footage stabilized. So cell phones actually do pretty good video. It's not as good as the ZV-1, but the ZV-1 doesn't fit in my pocket quite as easily, and it's not as easy to put on the gimbal as the cell phone is. All right. Uh, and then Jordan, talking about restaurants, says, we definitely have a lot of foodies on the live stream. I like planning restaurants, but sometimes I love stumbling into a great restaurant. Absolutely. I think it's worthwhile, and this isn't one of the tips I have on here, uh, but I'll mention it, which is to plan and research things, but be open to discovering things while you're there. Because you might see a place that smells delicious, looks delicious, and has a long line, and has a bunch of people that are speaking the local language instead of a bunch of people that are speaking languages that aren't from there. And in that case, go ahead and dive in, because you never know what you might find. That's part of travel and exploring, is just trying new things that you might not be familiar with before. The fifth best piece of travel advice I've ever received uh, is to prioritize staying at hotels with lounges. Now, this was something I didn't really appreciate until maybe five years into my kind of traveling experience. I did, I'd never been in a hotel lounge. I didn't know what a hotel lounge was. I'd seen the doors that said lounge, but what, what, the, what is a hotel lounge? And then... 
This tip actually came from a coworker of mine. We were staying together uh, in Denver at the Sheraton in Denver, and this was probably in 2004, 2005, and he was an elite member with Sheraton, and he invited me at the end of the day before we went to dinner to the lounge to have some like drinks and hors d'oeuvres before we went to dinner. And he's like, Chris, do you want to come to the lounge? I'm like, oh, what's the lounge? I don't know what the lounge. Oh, let's come to the lounge. They had, uh, you know, meat, meat on a stick, like yakitori, those sorts of things, drink, soda, alcohol. I was like, oh, this, this is pretty good. How do you, hey, coworker, how, how do you get into this lounge? I can't get into this lounge. Well, if you stay at a hotel a lot, they'll recognize you for staying there, and then you get access to the lounge. Some hotels allow you to pay more to get into the lounge, but it was at that point that I started staying with Marriott's a lot. And then in particular, when I stay at Marriott's, now that I have the status, I prioritize staying at Marriott's that have the lounge. Going to places like Zurich, Switzerland, for example, we saved probably a a gazillion dollars, I think, by having lounge access because everything in Switzerland is so expensive. Uh, we have breakfast at the lounge. We could sometimes come back even for like lunchtime or midday snacks or drinks. And then we would have uh, evening dessert in the lounge where we're like, boy, just having a coffee and a dessert and something like that in Switzerland, that would cost you $30 per person twice every day. Quickly, that lounge uh adds its value quite a bit. Points Traveler says, avoid courtyard hotels like the plague. I added like the plague. That's definitely a corollary to this one. I avoid courtyard hotels because you basically get no perks as a um, frequent traveler there. Uh, Booba MDL says, great tip from my pops. Research restaurant menus ahead of time to strategize and organize your travel dining budget accordingly. That's important too because it's important to know how expensive that place is going to be so that you're definitely not blowing your budget uh, eating there. Sue Pete wants to remind people if you're enjoying this video, please hit the thumbs up. I would appreciate it as well. 165 of you on currently and there's 47 likes so if you haven't please hit that thumbs up it helps me out helps out the channel lets youtube know you like this video so youtube shares it with other people uh larry speaking of food wants to know good cheap italian restaurant san diego larry my favorite is called mona lisa it's in little italy on india street check that out Wu Tai wants to know if i've ever just randomly picked a place and flew there on a whim not quite like that but i will say uh when i was chasing my united status, I would do mileage runs at the end of the year, and I would say, how many airline miles do I need, and what is the cheapest place that I can go to travel that many miles? So Singapore is often a place I would go to because from Southern California, it's the place that you could fly uh, longest and cheapest, um, but sometimes it might be New York, sometimes it might be Houston, so I've done destinations like that that's just like, where can I go for the price, and let's go check it out. The sixth best piece of travel advice I've ever received is that credit cards can earn you lots of free travel. This was definitely not from Dave Ramsey, but this was from my other favorite frequent flyer blog called View from the Wing. And when I first got started in the travel game... You know, I just had uh, like a like a GTE visa card or, or something that I signed up for in college. You know, when I was in college, there were some people standing around with a table. I got a free T-shirt, and that was my credit card. And I didn't realize how many rewards and free flights and free hotels I was missing out on. Uh, and in particular, I didn't realize how lucrative the sign-up bonuses could be for these credit cards. Um, and a because this becomes especially lucrative when you can meet and spend for the high sign-up bonuses via creative methods, for example, like buying dollar coins. Uh, the U.S. Mint had this program at one point in time where with your credit card, you could buy $500 in dollar coins for $500, and they would mail them to your house for free. Good deal. So if you're looking, if you were looking to spend $10,000 on a credit card, well, you just buy $10,000 in dollar coins and you either spend those dollar coins because you got money or you take them to the bank and deposit them to pay for your credit card. Uh, now, the corollary to this one, I will mention Dave Ramsey, who's all about not being in debt, which is, although I think credit cards are a great way to earn free travel, get travel perks, um, get insurance and protected on travel, Dave Ramsey says, the best vacation is the one that doesn't follow you home. 
And in this case, he's talking about debt. You don't want to be paying off your vacation once you get home because that vacation will not be as enjoyable when you're sitting there making these payments on it. The best vacation is the one that you save up the money, you pay for it, and when you go home, you just have memories, you have the videos, but you don't have debt that follows you when you come home. Uh, Ted uh, gives a tip, which is when you go to Hawaii, make sure to use sunscreen or you'll become a lobster. That's a good tip, Ted. I think that goes for a lot of locations. A lot of people, you, know, you go to snow locations, use sunscreen every day. A lot of people don't appreciate how bright the sun can be at the beach or how bright the sun can be in the snow. So that's really important. By the way, I see uh, about 30 more likes. There's 71 likes now up for 46. So thank you to the 30 of you that hit the thumbs up button. If you're not one of those 30 and you haven't hit the thumbs up button, then yet I would really appreciate if you do. Brett says Dave Ramsey is the best. Dave Ramsey is pretty good. Nightwolf wants to know, what are my thoughts on the Centurion Lounge? The Centurion Lounge is Amer the lounge network by American Express that you get access to if you have a platinum card or you have their Centurion card. I really like the Centurion Lounges in particular. I spend a lot of time in the past at the one at uh, San Francisco Airport because living in Southern California, flying United and Star Alliance, uh, if I connect to go to Asia, it's through San Francisco. And the Centurion Lounge is so much better than the United Lounge or those sorts of things. Um, I like the full meals at the Centurion Lounge. Like I can go in there and have a really good meal that includes some good kind of meat, that includes some good kind of vegetables, includes good beverages. I just I don't like how busy they've become. They've become really busy. And they're also restricting their guest policy now. So I'm not sure, honestly, if I'm going to continue with the platform card. That's the reason I have the Platinum card is to get into the Centurion Lounge and you used to be able to bring in uh, some guests along with you, but they're changing that in a year so you won't be able to bring in guests, which means if we're traveling uh, OC Girl and I with our daughter, then we'd have to pay to bring in the Traveling Princess and that, that just all doesn't uh, make sense. Um, Gene wants to know if Hawaii is crowded right now. I've heard long lines for restaurants. I'll be able to tell you in a few weeks when we go to Hawaii, but if anybody online uh, is in Hawaii right now, please let Gene, a fellow traveler, know whether Hawaii is crowded or not. Um, and uh, Carlos wants to know if I'm ready for Resorts World in Vegas. I am ready. I'm excited for Resorts World in Vegas. The seventh best piece of travel advice I've ever received is to go for the early morning flights. I don't remember who told me this, but I know somebody told me this, which made me go for the early morning flights. I am not an early riser. I don't like 6 a.m. I don't like 7 a.m. I like even less 4 a.m. is what the time you often have to get up for a 6 a.m. flight. I, by my nature of being a night creature, a creature of the night, like 1 p.m. flights. Leisurely get to the airport, have lunch, get on a 1 p.m. flight. Pretty nice. I do not like the delays and cancellations that come along with 1 p.m. flights. Why are afternoon and evening flights canceled more than morning flights? Because as the day goes on, there's more weather later in the day. There's more mechanical problems later in the day. Flights connect. They don't go someplace else. The early morning flight, if you are on the first flight out of an airport in the morning, that plane has been there since the night before. They've had time to work on it to fix any problems. And so you're getting on a plane that is the most likely to go someplace when it's a plane that's been sitting there overnight and you get on it in the morning. Uh, Wild Foodie Tours also says early morning flights make sense to avoid traffic and other airport hassle. That is so true. I will tell you, again, I hate 6 a.m. and 4 a.m., but 6 a.m. flights out of LAX well, LAX is the pits, but you get there for this 6 a.m. flight. There's no traffic. You breeze through security. Pretty good deal. Uh, Wu Tai says, I always leave on the 6 a.m. flight. I found it great if you don't like to sleep. All right. If you're not even a night owl but not a sleeper, I could see that. Alex points out about Hawaii that says, I was in Maui a few weeks ago. Restaurants were definitely crowded. Would try to make reservations. Thank you for the tip, Alex. The Uniplex says, best way to travel is early morning flights. I see we have many people. Now, Justin says, early morning flights are okay, but not the 1 a.m. flights. 1 a.m. flights are rough. They are. Mm. I only do those like in and out of Haneda in Tokyo. And if I do that, 
then like if I'm leaving someplace, I want to make sure I get like a late checkout, like a 4 p.m. checkout or something like that. So I'm not like checked out of my hotel at 10, wandering around all day, or I need to make sure that the ho- airport I'm going to has a, a lounge with a shower or something so I can take a shower before I get on a really late, long flight. Uh, Gary wants to know if we can take him with us to Hawaii. I don't know, Gary, can you fit into one of my suitcases? How small do you pack? Uh, and Carlos wants to know how Topher is doing. Topher, right here, I believe he is doing very good. He is excited to get some more aloha time in. He's a little disappointed that he hasn't been in more videos lately because the Traveling Princess has been featured in more videos. And so Topher says, hey, bro, put me put me back in. Put me back in, coach. That's what Topher says. The eighth best piece of travel advice I've received is that uh, if things don't go as planned while you're traveling, particularly in airports, stay calm. Be nice to the airline staff, but do ask for what you want. This is something I learned at a frequent flyer conference. Uh, I think it was one I went to in Phoenix, kind of like a casual frequent flyer meetup, a bunch of people that got together to talk about travel tips and advice. And uh, an example of this is I often fly out of John Wayne Airport in Orange County. And let's say I go to Hawaii from there. Well, United flights connect through San Francisco. There's often weather in San Francisco. The flights are often delayed. You know, the delay, they say like, hey, if you are connecting, please come up to the counter. We'll help you out. Uh, And then if you do that, then they're like, okay, well, we can book you out of a later flight out of San Francisco. But in my case... I know what I want, and I ask them for what I want, which is I go up to them and I say, hey, it looks like I'm going to misconnect. Could you put me on the direct flight out of LAX airport? Which is not something they would often think of. They're just going to be like, what's the route you're already going? What are other flights to put you on there? Maybe there aren't any more today. Let me get you there tomorrow. But I've already looked up while I was waiting in line or this and that what the other flights are, where they go from, whether they have seats on them. And so that case, I can just tell them what I want. And chances are, particularly if you're nice about it and you're sweet about it, because most people in airports when their flights are canceled are really rude and they, they like try to take it out on that gate agent or ticket agent because they personally delayed your flight. Of course they did. Uh, and if you ask them what they want, it's less brain power for them. They want to give you what they want so they can get rid of you so they can go on to the next person in that line. So um, always think about what potential options you could have and try to bring them a solution to your problem. But be nice about it and ask them like, hey, can you do this? You know, if you could, I'd That'd be cool. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, don't direct them to do it. That never works. You want them, the gate agents, the ticket agents, customer service on the phone to really feel like they are helping you and that you appreciate their help. Brett wants to know what I think about Burbank Airport. I have never flown out of Burbank. I have no comment on Burbank. I've flown out of Ontario, flown out of Long Beach, flown out of LAX. Burbank uh, is just a little bit too north for me. Um, I've heard a lot of good things about it, though. And uh, Eric agrees that no one likes an angry person. No one likes an angry person. And a little sugar definitely gets a little bit more than salt. Uh, Ted asks about credit cards that give you airport lounge access. Are they worth it? Well, earlier I mentioned I really like the American Express Platinum card, which I hold to get access to Centurion lounges. I also have the Chase Sapphire Reserve card, which gets access to Priority Pass lounges. It depends on the airports that you fly out of, whether those lounges are good. Some Priority Pass lounges really stink. They're just uh, like, they don't physically smell, but they're lousy in that they're just seats and crackers and carrot sticks. Uh, But other ones like the Turkish lounge at the Turkish Airlines Lounge at Washington Dulles Airport is a Priority Pass Lounge. It's my favorite Priority Pass Lounge in the U.S. You can get a full meal, beef, chicken, salad, soup, desserts. Um, so I, th- I think it can be. Uh, I don't think things like the United card that gives you United Lounge access is worth it because I don't think there's actually that much in the United Lounge. Greg wants to know, what's the story behind Yellow Productions? That's a long answer. Uh, I will tell you, I answered that all in my Frequently Asked Questions video. If you search for Yellow Productions FAQ, you'll find that one where I dive into the whole story behind Yellow Productions. You can say I like yellow, but it starts from a yellow car. Um, 
And Brooklyn says uh, a great way to get help from the gate agents or ticket agents is to bring some candy. Everyone has a sweet tooth. Yes, that's a good tip. Um, there's another good piece of travel advice, which is get if you fly a lot through the U.S. to get TSA pre-check. Uh, I think that's what you meant to say, which gets you access to the different security lines. So yes, we have uh, global entry, which gives us global entry and also TSA pre-check that comes with it. Uh, and Esther agrees, be specific asking what you want, but be nice about it. Um, mm, 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 mm. Wu Tai wants to know best Southern California wineries. I don't have a good answer for you on that, Wu Tai, as I haven't visited many Southern California wineries. I do know that Temecula is a really popular region for wineries, also a pretty popular region for Native American casinos. So head to Temecula, check out the wineries, then head over to Pala Casino and get a really good buffet. The ninth piece of best travel advice I've ever received. This one was from somebody I met in Sweden while I was on travel. I was talking to this guy and he was a like a triathlete, like a Swedish triathlete. He would run, he would swim and bike. And I and I asked him, I'm like, hey, how do you run, swim and bike and, and not end up with blisters on your feet? Because I get blisters on my feet all the time from walking. And he said, well, Chris, it's really simple. I wear wool socks wool socks that's hard wool w-o-o-l wool i wear socks made of wool wool socks uh, are naturally moisture wicking and you won't get blisters if you wear wool socks i'm like hmm. i always wore socks that i bought from costco big white tube socks because they're cheap you know like 10 pairs of socks for like 10 bucks i started looking into wool socks when i go on travel now i exclusively wear wool socks and in particular i don't know can you can you read this on here in particular i wear the wool socks by can you read that uh, smart wool is what that says here we go smart wool you can buy them at rei you can buy them other places now this sock cost more than 10 socks. It's like $15 for the pair of socks. Uh, so I've got a, I don't have a ton of these, but I have enough of them for every day that I go on travel and I wear these socks and they're a little bit hotter than cotton socks. But ever since I've been wearing these, I don't get blisters anymore. So if you get blisters on your feet, consider some wool socks. Mm. Esther wants to know if I've got the real ID yet. Yes. I went to the California DMV. I got the real ID. Um, any, if you're in the U.S., the real ID is a specific type of driver's license that you have to bring proof of your identification. Uh, I've got it. OC girl hasn't. OC girl just has decided she's gonna bring her passport with her when she travels because she doesn't. She's like, ah, oh, how much do I travel? Do I'll get it eventually at the DMV when I go. I hate the DMV. I don't love the lines there. So there you go. We're we're uh, we are split on that one. Um, but I had to go to the DMV for something else, and so I did it while I was there, too. Where's my map? Said, yes, Merino wool socks are the best. Darn tough brand is good. Thank you for the other brand suggestion. Where's my map? Um, SC Meadow says, Chris, what's your preferred time of year in airline for flying from the U.S. to Japan? Uh, my favorite time to go to Japan is in March or April for the cherry blossoms. If I'm not going for the cherry blossoms, then I go in like October for fall season, change of leaves. My favorite airline to fly to and from the U.S. is a and uh, Although... Um, this isn't a tip here, but, you know, direct flights are better than connecting flights. So if there's a direct flight from where you're going to, I would do that. Um, sometimes going to Tokyo, I like to fly out of San Diego Airport because most people don't realize Japan Airlines operates a direct flight from San Diego to Tokyo. Uh, and that's a lot better than going to LAX, frankly. Uh, and... Uh, <clears throat> Prakar asks, what's my opinion about compression socks? Moreover, what's your preferred neck pillow brand? Uh, I don't use either. I don't wear compression socks, and I also don't use neck pillows. I don't use neck pillows because I don't – I just don't like the bulk and the extra thing to carry around. So I don't sleep well on planes anyway, so it wouldn't help me out all that much. That might be why I don't, I don't do the neck pillow. Larry asks if Shake Shack is way better than In-N-Out Burger. 
I don't think Shake Shack is way better than In-N-Out Burger. I think Shake Shack, as burgers go, is better than In-N-Out Burger. It's also like twice the price of In-N-Out Burger. I think In-N-Out Burger still takes the position for me as best value. So I eat In-N-Out Burger the most. But Shake Shack burgers are pretty good. The tenth best piece of travel advice I've ever received is to also buy a set of travel everything. If you're somebody who travels a lot, like I do, then you'll spend a lot of time packing, unpacking, making sure everything's there, taking everything out of the bathroom. If you get a toothbrush or razor and you need to use it in the morning, then do you pack it at that time? So I have a set of travel everything. I have a set of travel toiletries. I have a set of travel electronics. I have a set of travel clothes. I literally have a whole section of my closet dedicated just to travel stuff. So that way, nothing I'm taking on travel cannibalizes any of the stuff that I use at home. Even for live streaming versus travel, I have a different camera that I travel with versus the camera that I stream here with. I have a different laptop that I travel with compared to the laptop that I use here uh, to monitor this live stream. Everything is separate for travel because that way when I unpack and repack, it's really simple because all those travel things just stay near the luggage and so they go in, they go out, they don't really get lost and that way I've just got it all when I go. Um, Esther says less is more when packing. For sure, although I will say I'm somebody who, who generally packs a little bit heavy. I like to be prepared, but I also like to think about what are the things I can buy in a destination, and if I can buy it there, maybe I don't need to take it. So if I'm going to Japan, you can buy an umbrella at every 7-Eleven, and so I probably don't have to take an umbrella. I probably can buy an umbrella when I get there. Um, uh, Brett asks if there's a good alternative airport to Las Vegas International in Las Vegas. Ah, nope, that's it. You're kind of stuck with Las Vegas Airport if you are flying there. Uh, Blobin wants to know if I still like the Marriott Grand Chateau in Vegas. I do still like the Marriott Grand Chateau in Vegas. What are my tips for dealing with jet lag? Uh, I would say my main tip for dealing with jet lag, one, Definitely get a good, well, I got a few tips, I guess. No, definitely one, get a good night's sleep the night before. Number two, stay hydrated. Number three, avoid alcohol. And then number four, and this is probably the most important tip, at least for me, when I get to a destination, let's say uh, I fly from LA to London and I get to London at like 5 a.m. It's the worst time to get someplace, right? Because you're like, I got a whole day ahead of me. What do I do? Do I take a nap? Do I stay up? In my case, I stay up. I try to spend as much time at my destination outside and in fresh air and then, you know, maybe go to sleep around 6 or 7 p.m. For me, that helps the most when I go to sleep at 6 or 7. I sleep pretty good. I might get up at 3, but it kind of works out the best. And so for me, just uh, walking around, exercise, and a lot of sun in the daytime helps with the jet lag. Meta wants to know if I've ever tried Turo, the car sharing service. I have not yet, but I contemplated it going to Hawaii since rental cars are so expensive. Craig wants to know if my preferred rental car company is. Um, Hertz is probably, Hertz and Avis are probably my preferred rental car companies. I like their sort of contactless pickup. Um, I also like Alamo because I like the uh, consoles they have, like the self-service consoles they have at uh, Alamo. John wants to know if uh, May Gray and June Gloom are bad, as people say in SoCal. It depends what you mean by bad. OC Girl likes the cool morning weather for May Gray and June Gloom. Now, if you're somebody who is expecting a sunny beach in the morning, don't. Uh, the beaches in Southern California in the morning in May and June are usually pretty cloudy and overcast until about 1 or 2. That's the May Gray and the June Gloom. That's just what it is. Wu Tai wants to know if I roll my clothing or if I stack them. I generally roll my clothing. My socks, I stack them. Um, but my shirts, uh, my underwear, um, I roll. If I have things I don't want to have too many wrinkles in, like polo shirts or things like that, then I fold and stack them. Wu Tai does not like Hertz. Well, we're all entitled to our opinion. Wu Tai, why don't you like Hertz? The 11th best piece of travel advice I've ever received is to carry my wallet, my wallet, in my front pocket. This one is from my mom. 
You know, you see a lot of people, they carry their wallet in their back pocket. They carry their wallet in their bag. Your back pocket and your bag, those are great places for them to get ripped off. This was particularly key for me in London where somebody stole my camera bag, my sling bag. They didn't get my wallet. They didn't get my passport because my passport and my wallet were in my front pocket. Front pocket is a really hard place to pickpocket something from. So if you've got valuables and uh, your guy and you've got front pockets or your girl and you got front pockets, you know, keep the valuable things in those front pockets because the front pockets are the hardest things to get uh, something out of. Um, the 12th best piece of travel advice I've ever received, this was uh, from a coworker, was to buy slash proof day gear. This coworker of mine told me a story where he was in Italy and he was walking down the street and he had a backpack and on the outside pocket of the backpack he had his wallet and he is where he had his money and he said, you know, at some point he got to his destination, he went to reach into that pocket and his hand went all the way through the bottom because somebody with a knife had just razored the bottom of the pocket to get his wallet out. While he was walking down the street, somebody walked up behind him, took a razor, slashed open that pocket, took out his wallet. From then, all of the day gear that we travel with in Europe and Asia um, is by PackSafe, which makes um, mesh metal mesh embedded into the bag so they're cut proof they're slash proof and nobody has been able to um pickpocket them someone stole the whole bag because i wasn't paying attention to it properly that's my fault uh but they didn't slice the bag open ilford says chris do you ever carry decoy wallets or bags i don't, but I do uh, carry some extra money hidden places, and I also carry extra copies of our passports places um, so that we have those back in the hotel room if we need them. Wu Tai says, Italy is fun for pickpockets to use your shoes. That's a good tip. It's probably really hard to pickpocket your shoes. Yeah. Kathy says, uh, slash proof. Yeah, when it's got metal in it, you know, somebody can't cut it with a knife. And actually, these uh, pack safe bags, so there's two places you want it to be slash proof. One is the bag itself, but then two is the strap. Um, because that's a popular way in Europe. People thieve things as they come by on mopeds or scooters. They cut the strap of the bag and then they just take the bag because it's not attached to your shoulder anymore. Uh, Larry wants to know if the wallet that I showed, I have any money in it. Let's see. What have I, what have I got in this wallet? I have, I have $40. I have $40 in this one. Uh, $45 in this wallet. There we go. Uh, Carlos says the next time I should put toe in my front pocket if my front pocket was big enough. I will, I'll keep that in mind. I think I probably have to get bigger front pockets to fit toe in there. The 13th best piece of travel advice I've ever received is to buy Ramoa luggage. This comes from Flyer Talk. Flyer Talk is a frequent flyer message board. A lot of the things I've learned about frequent flyer tips and credit cards, if they haven't come from blogs or they haven't come from uh, frequent flyer meetups, they've come from Flyer Talk as a message board. And there were always regular posts on Flyer Talk about deals on Ramoa suitcases. And I'm like, what's the big deal about Ramoa suitcases? Why are so many people looking for deals on these suitcases? And... Then, uh, you know, I saw so many people talking about them, and I couldn't afford them in the U.S. because they're so expensive. And then I was taking a trip connecting through Frankfurt, and I bought a Lufthansa-branded Ramoa suitcase at the Lufthansa World Shop in Frankfurt Airport for like $200 for the carry-on size one, which is about a third of the price of what you would pay for an equivalent one in the U.S., um, and I love the suitcase so much, the wheels, how it moves, how light it is, how strong it is, that then when O. Siegel and I went back on another trip to Germany to Munich, we then bought four more Ramoa suitcases uh, from this store called Hetzenecker, which is like the place to buy Ramoas if you go to Munich. And 
The great things about Ramoa is like they're really sturdy, but if anything breaks, you can just take it to a Ramoa store and they fix it. I was on travel once in Waikiki and my zipper got stuck. Um, I took it to the Ramoa store. They just replaced the whole zipper. No charge, no questions asked. Uh, and so I... I love them. Esther says, Ramoa is the best. I got two. The wheels actually roll properly and reliably. What a concept. They do. They roll properly, reliably for years and years, to, decades to come. I, I think our Ramoa suitcases are 10 years old now, and they're, they're just as good as the day we bought them. You know, a little dirty from wear, uh, but other than that, still pretty good. Uh, and Esther agrees about wearing handbags with metal straps. CN recommends a money belt. That's probably a good way to keep the money to yourself, too. I don't wear a money belt, but uh, I'm not saying you shouldn't. Greg wants to know if I use concierges at hotels. I'll tell you what I use concierges at hotels for. One, if I want to make a reservation at a restaurant that's like a hard to reserve restaurant or I don't think I speak the language sometimes I will email or call ahead to the hotel and ask them if they can make the dinner reservation for me uh, so that's one and then two I do often ask the concierges something like hey I've never been here before do you have some recommendations as to what we should see or do and I, I keep it as open and simple as that and let them pull out the map and talk about what they recommend um, we've got some really good recommendations I mean sometimes I throw them away but sometimes they're really cool too when we were in Tokyo we asked the concierge at the Hyatt Place Hotel in Tokyo what like you know what he recommends we go to and he said you should definitely check out the Starbucks Reserve Roastery in Tokyo. It's really neat. But it wasn't on our list of things to do, but we did. And we're like, man, this place is super cool. How come we didn't know about this place? I don't know. It's just not on the top of a lot of touristy things, but it was really new. What was really neat. <laughs> Esther gives a good tip right here. I should have put this in the best travel advice I've ever received. Esther, maybe this is number 21, which is <laughs> make sure to get suitcase colors that aren't the same old, same old. Yeah. The black suitcase that looks just like everybody else's. Don't get it. Not because it's hard to identify yours when it comes out. That's one reason. But two, you don't want other people to mistake yours for theirs. And so, like, I've got bright color suitcases. Um, but also, I put stickers on them. I paint them with different colors so that when people see my suitcase, they know my suitcase isn't theirs. Uh, Martin's funny. He says, wait, the travel lodge has concierges? I stay at some really fancy travel lodges, let me tell you. Um... Carlos wants to know, how many Marriott hotels have I stayed at? Oh, hundreds of Marriott hotels. I, I, don't, I don't know that I uh, know the number. Wutai wants to know, what was the worst hotel you ever stayed at ever? Not just Las Vegas. The worst hotel I've ever stayed at was in Las Vegas. Um, but maybe something that's not Las Vegas, because I know I've told that story before. Uh, another worst hotel I stayed in was a, a core hotel in... Uh, in the south of France. And this hotel, like, like you get to the hotel room. Yeah, you got, I got to the hotel room, and all of the outlets were plugged up. They only had one outlet that was working. They've plugged the rest of them up because I guess they don't want you stealing their power. You know, it was like you go into the bathroom, and there's, like, one single towel there. And there's no Kleenex. There's just toilet paper. I ask if they have ice. They're like, well, you can get it at the bar. I go to the bar, I ask for ice. They give me a glass with one cube in it. I go, can I get some more ice? And they go, no. And they show me a bucket of ice. And they're like, see, this bucket of ice is all the ice we have for our whole hotel. It was, it was a fantastic place. The 14th best piece of travel advice I've ever received. This is from OC Girl. That it's okay to split up on a trip. If you're traveling with your significant other, your friend, your parents... It's okay to do some different things. If you want to go shopping, but your friend wants to go, I don't know, on a roller coaster in Las Vegas, let your friend go on the roller coaster. You go shopping, meet up again in two hours. Sometimes there's going to be some things you want to do. The person you're with doesn't want to do. It's okay. Pick a half day. Go do some different things. Not everybody has to be a victim and be bored. Esther also gives a tip to say, don't rely on the paper luggage tags at the check-in desk they rip off. They sure do. Those things are worthless. Get some sturdy luggage tags on the outside. 
also write your name, print it out, have something on the inside too in case all the stuff on the outside gets ripped off. Wild Foodie Tourist has a glass with a single ice. It was classic. It was really really funny you would have you would have had to have been there i was there with a, a friend of mine and we were we were we were just both blown away we talked about that hotel for years to come afterwards it was a fantastic place for sure chris 2021 uh and ilford said great advice sometimes it's too much spending time with the same people yeah particularly if you have like a big group if you've got like eight people or something like that like you can't please all those people so just plan a day to be like man today we're all going to do different things and so the corollary on this one in addition to it being okay to split up is it's okay to travel solo there's a lot of people who say i can't travel by myself i need to travel with somebody else you can travel solo i travel i've been solo on a lot of trips. OC Girl has been solo on a lot of trips too. We've even done some trips where we've started the trips in different places and then like met up in Singapore. Like we make it kind of fun to be like, hey, I'll meet you in the lobby of the Singapore Marriott, you know, like some movie sort of thing. So totally cool. Uh, Brian puts his list as number one is Ramoa, number two is Toomey, and number three, Briggs and Riley. I would agree with that. I think that's a pretty good list. Number four, I would put Travel Pro. I've got some Travel Pro bags. They're not as big or fancy as those other ones, but the price point's pretty cheap. And so I think uh, Travel Pro is a really good value brand of bags. And username says YOLO Solo. You only live once, so go ahead and go solo. And this guy says the ice budget can be a killer for hotels overhead. Yeah, I, I guess so. We, we, we probably we, we weren't paying that much for those hotel rooms. That's two. Tip number fifteen: If you're looking for a really kind of unique souvenir, place a way to remember some place is to mail yourself a postcard. Actually, some of these things you see back here. Ah, let's see. Um. Maybe they're over there on that side that you can't see. But some of these things are actually postcards that we've mailed ourselves from destinations. We'll go to Tokyo, buy a postcard, we'll mail it. We'll go to Paris, we'll get a postcard, we'll mail it with a little note about what we were doing that day. Uh, when we were in Hokkaido, Japan, in Sapporo, the north, it's really famous for crab. But we got a, a postcard in the shape of a crab and mailed ourselves a crab postcard and some it's funny to then like come home and be home for like two weeks and be like oh there's my postcard that was funny tip number 16 this one's also from rick steves is to become a temporary local this is a different phrase than to travel like a local or do what locals do become a temporary local and Rick Steves would say to skip the fancy tour bus that ends up in a gift shop. Instead, you should take the subway, the streetcar, whatever the locals take. Experience the city the way the locals do. Skip the expensive hotel lunch buffet. Eat where the locals eat. Some of the best noodles are down an alley in a place without a sign that you eat on the street. Now, this might mean that you'll be going to eat at places that don't have English menus. That's okay. Figure it out point, use some sign language, use Google Translate. It's all okay. Um, I've been in some places in Taipei, Taiwan, where there was no English menu. My Mandarin is not that great, and uh, but definitely pointing and a few little things got me through it, and I got some really, really tasty noodles, really tasty soup, really tasty dumplings. Um, but really, to become a temporary local, you have to spend long enough in a place to do it. If you're just there for a day, you got to take the whirlwind bus tour of London. You won't be able to see it all, but if you want to experience London like a temporary local, spend a week there. You know, spend more time in a place so you can really just kind of get into it and, and wander down the alleys. Esther said, I sent a postcard to my devout mom from the Vatican. I became the daughter of the century. I bet you did, Esther. Esther, you got a lot of great tips and ideas today. You are on fire today, Esther. Uh, Wu Tai wants to know if I have any wooden art postcards. I think we might have one. I can think of maybe one. I don't know where it is. Actually, I can see it. It's over there. You can't see it, but trust me, there is a wooden art postcard up on the wall over there. All right. The 17th best piece of travel advice I've ever received is from my mom. To have afternoon recharge time. 
And my mom's idea of afternoon recharge time is to uh, stop at a bakery, to get an apple strudel, to get a cherry danish, to get a coffee, to get some milk, spend 30 minutes, eat that, drink your beverage, get some air conditioning, rest your feet, and then be ready to go on for the day. Sometimes touristing around can just be a slog and you get really tired and so it's worthwhile to just spend some time resting a little bit refueling getting those calories in getting the drinks in resting your feet so that you're ready to conquer the rest of the day instead of march 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 and then collapsing at five o'clock because you didn't take any opportunity to rest a corollary on this one is not to be cheap on breakfast i think breakfast is the most important meal of the day. Uh, and so make sure you have a good breakfast before you start. If there's not a good breakfast in your hotel, then get a good breakfast nearby, but make sure you get something to eat so you're not going for five hours on an empty stomach. The 18th best piece of travel advice I've received, it's about jet lag. We talked about it earlier, but simply uh, to beat jet lag, spend as much time as possible outside in the sun on your first day of arrival. The 19th best piece of travel advice I've ever received is that carry-on is the only way to travel. I don't always do this, but if I can, particularly if I'm connecting a lot, I will carry on. Now, going to Hawaii with our traveling princess, we're definitely going to check in because we've got strollers and car seats and baby carriers and so we're definitely not traveling light but in that case we're taking a direct flight one flight your luggage doesn't have that many places to get lost you don't have a lot of other opportunities to change flights but if you're changing flights a lot you need to be flexible on them carry on you make sure you've always got your stuff with you and the 20th best piece of travel advice i've ever received uh, actually comes from the famous anthony bourdain and Anthony Bourdain says to dress for airport security. And specifically in Anthony Bourdain, you can probably hear him saying this, do not be the jerk in line who holds everybody up while they slip off gold chains, belts, and watches, and then act surprised that they can't bring their jug of soda on the plane. And my corollary to this one is also wear shoes that are easily designed to slip on and slip off. The knee-high boots might be quite fashionable, particularly with the spurs. Ting, 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 ting. But, you know, some sandals that you can slip on or slip off are probably a lot better. And Fat Nuts says there can only be one Clark Griswold. Try not to be him. I think that is a good tip for sure. Yes, it's the time you've been waiting for. It's time for the giveaway. All right, fellow explorers, today, as usual on the live streams, I'll be giving away a Yellow Productions Crew shirt to a lucky viewer. If you answer my question correctly, and my question is, where and at what hotel chain brand did I stay in my first, I didn't stay, I visit my first hotel lounge? What city and what hotel was my first hotel lounge experience? It was one of the things I talked about as we were talking about this. As we do this, I will take one or two questions while we're waiting. Let's go ahead and see where the last question was. Um, well, there's some comments. Leandra says, Anthony Bourdain, rest in peace. I've learned so many awesome things. Anthony Bourdain was great. Points Traveler offers another note. If your airline offers you an upgrade for a decent price, take it to enjoy the experience and extra points you receive. Assuming it's a decent price. I agree. 100 bucks, 200 bucks, I'd, I'd upgrade classes. I would probably not spend thousands of dollars to upgrade. And now we have a winner, winner, chicken dinner. Gilberto Carmona, congratulations. You are the winner of the Yellow Productions Crew shirt. The hotel that I first stayed at in a hotel lounge was the Sheraton in Denver. So send me an email. You'll find my email address in the description, or you can message me on Facebook. Let me know what size shirt you want 
and where you want me to send it to. Now, for those of you who wonder, Chris, when is the Lex Knive? When is the Lex Knive? Lex Knive next live. When is the next live stream? Well, if you want to know, make sure to head over to update.yellow-productions.com. Sign up for my email list a day or two before every live stream. I'll send you an email and let you know what time it's going to be, what it's going to be about, so you know when it is and you can tune in. Well, fellow explorers, it was a pleasure hanging out with all of y'all today. Always appreciate hanging out with all of you. Thank you for the 223 of you that were here. If you haven't hit that like button yet, please do it. Really helps me out. And as usual, I won't say goodbye because I'll see you all in the next video.